Uh, I guess I'd like to welcome to the stage the director of HAL, Paul Hyatt. Thank you all for saying. Yeah, thank you. Um, are you saying there's something to look out for in the credits? Are you saying there's something to look out for in the credits? Oh, there's just a, a, a nowhere also harmed in the middle of the film. I think that's a lie though, isn't it? That's, that's surely a lie. Well, no, no wells. I wouldn't. Um, so obviously you, you come from uh, an FX background, uh, you know, worked for kind of many years making, you know, doing effects for, for some, some great films, including The, the, the Descent and Doomsday. Um, when you're coming to a film like this where you've got loads of kind of uh, creature effects, you're used to kind of, you know, as an effects designer, creating a kind of story for how those creatures kind of work. Did you do the same for this, even though you weren't doing the effects for this? Did you create a kind of your own mythology for, for, for these creatures? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I really wanted to get away from was, uh, this is when I first get, got the script, they weren't really described in, in complete detail, and one thing I wanted to get away from was big, big, furry werewolves, because they'd been done so brilliantly before in stuff like the Howlin and the Memoir of London. It, I just didn't want big snouts, and I kind of felt, because I was getting rid of the mythology of the, the, the transforming the a full moon and the silver bullets and I was trying to ground it a little bit more into sort of London a bit more sort of real I thought get away from that sort of romanticized mythology and have it more realistic that if someone got bitten it would take like 30 years for them to transform that it wasn't suddenly you transform and then the full moon is there and then you transform back it was more over years and years these feral dirty disgusting creatures that lived in the woods their bones would break and reform, their muscles would split and reform, and it would take years to transform rather than just suddenly pop and then back again. So that was kind of my thinking of, and also because I didn't want the sort of snouts and big furry things, was one of the reasons was because we had all these great characters on board of the train, I kind of wanted to give the, character, the creatures their own kind of distinct look and a bit more of a human aspect to them. So I think. And this works perfectly well for some movies where you just get like a big dog-like creature that rampages him and kills them. I kind of felt we wanted more of a sort of human aspect and the sort of whole story with the alpha males and the, the female creatures. It, it, it felt more like we should go this route. And, and how do the actors find it working with, because uh, obviously you must work with a lot of actors, a lot of prosthetics, and, and you know exactly how much work that is and <laughs> how many hours it takes. Do, when you're casting something like this, do you have to kind of make people aware of the fact that there's going to be a lot of prosthetics and do you have to kind of, do you have to find people with the right sensibility for something like this? Yeah, basically, um, the, the three female whales are played with guys that do, um, they've been in loads of creature suits. One, the, the, the blonde creature was played by Ross Mullen, who's the white, white walker in Game of Thrones and, and I think he's, he just, yeah, he does a lot of creature work. The other guys did a lot of creature work as well, like Penny Dreadful. The big male whale was, um, for you that see my last movie, um, Ryan Olivia, who's a big rapist dude, a huge guy, he played it, and I said to him... He's a character a rapist dude, just to kind of... Yeah, yeah, he's not, he, he's not a rapist, uh, his, 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 his character's a rapist, and, and he's like the sweetest guy in the world, he, he's just really scary to really first meet him, but he's like six foot seven, huge, and I kind of knew I wanted to make this creature really big, and we, we essentially, this creature suit was, it was kind of like having a sofa glued to you. It was so much rubber and, you know, you could really smell the foam and, but yeah, he was huge. And I said to him, I want, you'll scare you without prosthetics. So we have these creature prosthetics and you ran pages through the train, you know, that should be really, really scary. So he didn't kind of quite realize how hard it was going to be. Because, I mean, his creature suit was maybe that thick. It was huge. So, being encased in that and glued into it and sweating and getting him on the harnesses, I mean, it was a huge undertaking. And you could just tell when the suit came off, you could just ming it and sweat it. You know, like a set. You know, it was that big. And in terms of moving from uh, an effects background into directing, does, does it really help? Well, how long was the shoot for this, was it? Uh, five weeks. So does it really help in terms of you know how long the effect is going to take? You as a director know how long the effect is going to take and how much prep you need to do. Does it really help for... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the worst thing when you're a prosthetic makeup guy is when you've done makeups and you're the last thing to shoot. You know, you're sitting around for five hours and the makeup's coming off. And they're like, okay, we're going to shoot close-ups now. So I didn't do that. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, all the sort of the stunt sequences, the action sequences, the big prosthetic scenes, all that sort of stuff, as well as all the visual effects, you know, my history in prosthetics and films, it, it was invaluable because I just didn't waste resources, I didn't waste time. I knew exactly all the sort of elements that they needed to sort of build the visual effect shots. I understood the whole process of whether we're doing 2D shots or 2.5D shots or whether they're going to be 3D animated shots. You know, how to sort of, you know, work out, okay, practical effects, what, what do we need? And I mean, all those blood, blood effects, like when a guy gets his neck bit and blood squirts up, that was CG, but I would shoot all the blood effects on green and put them in afterwards. So I know if I was there on set and I was trying to do that as a one-off, probably wasn't going to happen, you know, it's, it's really hard to spend the time doing a big huge blood squirt and then having to clean it off and do it again and so it's always about trying to take what I've learned from, you know, my prosthetics background and bringing it onto this one. And how do you strike that balance between the prosthetic and the sort of CG? Because I know people really kind of fetishise, oh you do great prosthetic effects but it can be a lifesaver having the CG kind of, to, to, just to supplement what you're doing with the prosthetic. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of people have sort of said, isn't it great that, you know, Paul's gone back to doing practical creature suits and this. It's like, well, they're 50-50. They're I mean, you know, yes, they're wearing creature suits, because I always think if you can have a, a creature on set as much as possible, it's brilliant for the actors to be able to work with. But there's all the other things you can't do with prosthetics. I can't have triple jointed legs. I can't have a, a jaw that opens right up. So it was all about trying to work out what I had CG and what I had practical. And yeah, I think it was kind of like a, a half half mix. The CG guy is always like, oh no, we don't know to work on that. And everyone's saying, oh, that's a great creature suit. So yeah, it is about, and also with the gore effects as well, it's all about, you know, do as much as you can practically and then enhance with, with CGI. I think one of the other doesn't really, nowadays, you know, to try to do everything in camera, prosthetic and practical, it's really hard because you don't really have the time to do it. And there's certain parts that, you know, if there's a, a, a neck gig and like blood squirting out and there's a blood tube and there's a, like a seam in the makeup, in the old days, that was it. You know, whatever you went on set with, you know, you kind of hope they liked it well. Nowadays, it's like, you know, go down there, it's, it's easier and quicker for them to get rid of it in post for us to spend half an hour making it better. So, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to how it was 20 years ago in my, when I was doing prosthetics, to what it is like now. It's, you know, it's so different. But it's great to have that CG sort of um, help, because I remember when it was so expensive, if you asked them just to do a paint over a seam or just add something, or it was tremendously expensive. Now, the guys are, yeah, we could do that in two days. Now, totally, this is a very different film to The Seasoning House, which uh, is a little bit different. A little bit different. And how much of that was a conscious move on, on, on your part? Yeah, it's huge. Um, I just kind of felt with Seasoning House, you know, it's this dark, brutal, nihilistic movie, and I kind of felt for my second film, I should really do something that is completely opposite, because for everyone that loves Seasoning House, and someone's like, oh my God, that's horrible, brutal, and, you know, I hated it. And, you know, it stayed with me for days, or why do you want to make a film where someone gets raped to death and all this sort of stuff? And I was like, yeah, maybe I should do something a little bit different. And when, when the producers contacted me, you know, it's like reading the script, it's like, this is like a cool retro creature feature, just a popcorn, it's not going to offend anyone, there's, there's no weight, there's no sort of horrible stuff in this. So, yeah, it, and I like the script as well, I like characters, and, you know, I liked it that it was such a, you know, with Season House, it was all about story and performances and characters, where this one was, you know, a big technical challenge of how do we pull this off? You know, we didn't have a huge amount of time to shoot it. It's five weeks with that many stunts and fights and wire rigs and fire stuff and CGI. It, you know, I love the idea of the, the technical challenge, but also there was a nice story there and it just wasn't going to offend anyone. That was a big thing. And can you talk a little bit about the shoot? Because people may not be aware of uh, <laughs> exactly how much uh, of, of, yeah, of a fantasy you had to kind of create here in terms, in terms of you did shoot on location for... for... We did, the, the, the bits we did on location was when they were running through the forest right at the end. But all the shots where they get off the train and walk up the train, all that was done in a little warehouse in Croydon. Um, there, there was a lot of logistical issues. So we thought, oh, let, let's see what it's like, you know, shooting on a real train. And suddenly you realise actually on the train with 30 crew with 
nine actors with creatures. It was just impossible. It was really just to be able to do interesting stuff with a camera. You know, I like my steady cam stuff, and that was impossible. And it's like we're ready to put the lights, and where's your source of lights going to be, and people are going to fall over each other. So we we thought, you know, something we've got to build a train. So we built a train, and we were kind of like, okay, this is perfect. So we've got a 50 foot train set inside. And we thought, well, we'll do the outside shots when they're outside of the train, uh, walking along, we'd find a real train. And then we, we went to see various rail companies. And they were like, oh, you want to go underneath the train? I was like, yeah. And they're like, yeah. I was like, why not? He goes, we hit a lot of people. And, you know, and I was like, oh, really? I was like, how many do we hit a week? And they're like, oh, two. And I was like, two a week? He's like, yeah. I was like, because uh, you know, imagine sticking an act down there. Because oh, sometimes there's issues with the electricity, and and then it says stuff like you have nine people on, on the outside of the train. It's like there's eight people in the you know crew. So it, it became really obvious quickly we could not do that. So we said, okay, let's build the outside of the train. And then we're like, okay, let's build the the forest as well. And it just ended up being this huge warehouse. So instantly then it's like, okay. You could, we have to then digitally create the entire background. So everything's on green, so it's always how many shots can I have that are, you know, background shots and the CGI guys go mad because every time I say, I won't see the green screen in this, obviously we always did. And they're just like, oh God, stop doing that. Um, but yeah, so, and, and then we had all these plastic plants and real plants, which, which sound like a really great idea, but then over the weeks, all the real plants would start turning brown and the plastic plants would stay green. So it was like constantly trying to, you know, they, they were like, yeah, these plants will be fine as long as you look after them. They all die in big <laughs> days, it felt like. So, well, it's an amazing achievement to do that in five weeks and, and, and do mm -hmm. you know, most of that in the studio with the, you know, all the effects and stuff that you've got. Um, I'd like to open up to the audience if anybody here has got any, any questions. Jane Hyman's got a question, of course she has. Jane. <laughs> Right. Given your special effects background, how hard do you find it to take a step back from the special effects and make it as well as you do that? It, it was easy on this one. My first movie, um, I, I was a bit of a pain because I'd always be like picking up a brush and going, oh, what, what, what is this? And they're like, no, no, just tell us what you want. And I'd say, well, it, it would take me as long to tell you what to do for me to do it myself. And they're like, oh, just, just let us do it. And I, oh, so I was a little really bit of a pain. But because it was like you know, only a couple of people on the, in the scene, it was much easier for them to shoot. With this one, there were so many technical challenges of just trying to work out how I was going to shoot it on the train with a steady cam, and it just got to a point where I was really lucky that I could just say, Christian Mallet, just you know, make it. And we spent a lot of time working it out and designing it. But yeah, pretty much when I was on set, there was so much for me to do. I was, I was able just to say, just, just see it as a director, just come on, yeah, this is cool, just wet them up a bit, you know, and do this with a colour. So I was very, very hands off compared to my first movie. And it was actually easier than I thought it was just to be able to step back because I'm usually a bit of a pain in the ass, but, you know, this one I was just too busy, so. Um, yeah, you had Sean Pertwee in there. Was that supposed to be a nod to dog soldiers at all? Um, yeah, I kind of, I, I mean, I, I love Sean Pertwee and I've, I've killed him many times. <laughs> and, you know, he's always lovely to have on set, but I thought it's kind of fun that, you know, Sean Pertwee battles werewolves again and gets killed again. Um, Does he uh, mind? Hmm? Does he mind? No, he, he, he kind of likes it, really. It was, um... I remember I, I, I killed him so many ways, like, you know, I've, I've cooked him and sliced him up and ripped his face off with a fake dog. There's all these ways I've killed him, and I was just like, you know, Sean, will you do this just before you... Because he was just about to go off and do Gotham. And I was like, oh, you just, just come for a day, just get killed by a werewolf. He was like, yeah, cool, sounds good. So it was like a little lucky charm. I love Sean. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so um, what have you got lined up next? Oh. Um, very, very, very close to. to <laughs> yeah, well, you probably don't want to say anything. You don't want to say until. Yeah, yeah. You know what it's like. It's now you know, it's, 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 it's getting there. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks a lot for, for bringing Hal, and I hope you really enjoyed it. And uh, say a big round of applause for Paul Hyatt. <laughs>